Hello everyone, I'm Bethlehem Artfield. Welcome to the podcast Journey to Ethiopia with a Story. The Scroll of Aksum is a story that will take you on a journey to 6th century Aksumite Kingdom. The story is mostly narrated from an unnamed woman's perspective who lived in the royal court of Emperor Caleb in Abyssinia. God must have truly had a weakness for our land and people. How else could we be so blessed? I couldn't wait to discuss this with Caleb. I was gaping like a fool. My mother, oblivious to the conversation in the other room, looked alarmed and sharply nudged me. I quickly composed myself and picked up a ball of cotton. The Scroll of Axum Part 2 Although Caleb is my cousin, we are more like siblings. We were born in the same year and when the queen, Caleb's mother, was too poorly to feed the infant, my mother, who was her sister-in-law, as well as her lady-in-waiting, started feeding us both, as one does with twins. When the queen passed away five years later, my mother, who was already Caleb's witness, also became his foster mother. Caleb and I remained close throughout our childhood sharing an insatiable curiosity for our history. The fifth day of the month of Hedar, the day after we turned 10 years old, became the highlight of our education. Caleb and my father were to travel to Sestili in the old Muriatic kingdom. Caleb bragged, I am to witness for myself the great stone stele our forefather, King Ezana, erected at the confluence of Atbara and the Nile River. I pleaded with my father to take me along to no avail. I finally resorted to acting so desolate whenever I was around Caleb that he couldn't stand it. When Saturday, my favorite day of the week, came and my mood hadn't lightened up, Caleb was worried. I loved Saturdays because it was the only day that Caleb didn't have either tuition or court visitors. It was a day where no official duties or chores intruded between us so we could feel like normal carefree siblings. That evening, Caleb explained to my father that he wished for my mother and I to accompany him on this journey. My father couldn't resist Caleb's request. My excitement had no bounds as we prepare for our travel. A caravan of 300 horses was to accompany us. It was quite a sight. The soldiers with their white cotton tunics and linemen collars, the priests with their long robes and turbans, the royal family with bright colored silk embroidered robes, the servants and slaves wore loose traditional dresses. We were to ride our beautiful horses while the rest of the entourage were to ride their mules. Our food and belongings were loaded on camelbacks. We left our city, Aksum, on the first day of Er, fifth month of that year. As usual, riding through Aksum gave me thrills. What a glamorous and bustling metropolis the city presented with traders coming from Egypt, Rome, and even as far as India. Most of these traders could easily conclude their businesses at the port of Adulis, but they still preferred to come to Aksum to witness for themselves our culture and our famous obelisks. As we passed, I marveled as usual at the tallest of these monolithic structures, standing tall at 110 feet, with 13 floors carved upon it. When we rode south through the jagged chain of mountains and followed the deep canyons created by Takeze River in the west, I was reminded of the story Caleb's tutor told about the creation of our land. On the fourth day, we arrived at the confluence of Atbara and the Nile, where the stele was still standing intact. It resembled a smaller version of King Ezana's obelisk, which towers 70 feet over our city of Aksum. 
I traced the letters with my fingers. Caleb read them out loud and translated for us. Praise be to Almighty God who gave me, his servant, an easy conquest during the battle to control Meroi. I surveyed our bedroom one last time and rang the bell for the servant to collect the leather bags I had filled with our clothing. I should have been grateful to be part of this glorious history in all of Christendom and support my husband in his new role in Himia. A few years earlier, Ayuhudoj, the Jews from South Arabia, started persecuting Christian traders, including Abyssinians. Emperor Caleb, with the support of Alexandria and the Byzantines, waged war against the Himariat Jews. He prepared 72 ships and 70,000 warriors and prayed, Almighty God, the creator of the universe, who has multitudes of angels at your disposal, Lord of Lords, Father of the Holy Saviour, in the name of your only child whom you have sent to earth to save us, witness the horrendous atrocities the Himariatic Jews have inflicted on Christians, and do not shame me in my quest to seek vengeance for your children. If you, my father, deem my sins numerous and will not hear my prayer, please let me perish right now instead of in battle. Please, Lord, do not let my people fall in the hands of the enemy who denied you. When Emperor Caleb reached Hemia, the Jewish king, Dunuas was waiting for him with a 30,000 strong Jewish army and ordered the battle to begin. Dunuas's army, who were waiting on the ships, started raining arrows and spears on the Abyssinian fleet. However, the Christian naval fleet had the advantage of a few experienced Byzantine commanders who advised the Abyssinian fleet to maintain strategic formation of their ship. Soon, in the heat of the battle, some Himariat ships drifted off to the main body and were easily destroyed, while Dunuas' ship came broadside to the Abyssinian fleet and the two armies engaged in close-range battle. My brother Jacob, who was one of the commanders of the Abyssinian ship, ordered Tanquas, reed boats, to be lowered into the shallows. The soldiers used rope for the descent. Jacob ordered some of the young archers and slingers to stay on board and cover those being lowered on the boats with their arrows and slingshots. Before the boats reached shore, the few Christian ships loaded with bolstay started launching their imposing javelin, which overwhelmed the Himariat army on shore. Soon, hand-to-hand -hand combat with spears and swords raged, with the Abyssinians pushing the Himariats. Jacob's good quality productive armor, presented to him by the emperor himself, managed to fend off many fiery arrows from the enemy. The loyal young soldiers on the ship were more focused on covering their commanders than anyone else. This gave Jacob and many other officers a chance to fearlessly pursue their enemies on their abundant horses all the way to town. Loath to witness the ransack of his domain, Dunuas spurred his stallion into the sea and drowned. The Abyssinian army thanked their god for the victory and showed mercy to the defeated army and civilians. They allowed them to bury their dead and pacified them by promising them that none of their properties would be looted. Emperor Caleb left an army of 5,000 and posted General Abraha as viceroy. My young brother Jacob was also to stay in Sana'a as General Abraha's personal assistant. A few years on, Abraha rebelled and became the self-proclaimed king of South Arabia. The emperor, keen to avoid bloodshed among his own people, did not try hard to overthrow Abraha. Instead, he appointed my husband as a financial counselor to collect Sazarabian tributes. 
Jacob, who was keen to meet his little niece Azeb for the first time, was waiting for us with a group of servants and horses at the harbor of Himia. Although he was attired like the local Arabs, I made out my little brother as he swiftly walked along the quay in our direction. I leaned down and told Azeb that the man who was coming towards us was my beloved brother. Azeb skipped ahead towards the uncle she was meeting for the first time. I could hear Jacob's booming laugh as he gave her a big hug and picked her up in his arms. He then said, That sounds funny. What does it mean? inquired the inquisitive Azeb. It means, welcome, my darling. If you are indeed like me, as your mother claims you are, you'll pick up Arabic in no time, little one, he responded, as he put her down and rushed to greet us. While we were riding to Sana'a, where General Abraha and his men were stationed, Yaakov explained, Zafar was the capital of Himyarites until we took over, and Himyar were a tribal confederacy which at one point extended as far as Riyadh. We rode through a colorful market town where traders were uploading goods from their camels. There was another market town by the shore, Kana, the center for frankincense, Jacob said, pointing to the bay. And facing it, there were two desert islands, one called Island of Birds and the other Dome Island. All the frankincense produced in the country used to be brought by camels to Kana and loaded on boats. But nowadays, the demand for frankincense has gone down since Christians prefer to bury their dead than to embalm and cremate. What does to embalm and cremate mean? Azeb, who was riding with me on a beautiful stallion, called out. Jacob laughed and winked at me. I'll tell you all about it in good time, my dear. Thank you for listening. We hope you'll come back to this podcast to listen to the rest of the story. Until the next time, goodbye for now.